I love to read books. You can learn from reading books. You can love, you can love learning so many ways. You can learn talking to someone, listening to someone, looking at something. And sometimes you can learn by getting up and playing a game and having some fun. Let's do a little bit of that today. So go grab a piece of paper and a pencil, and you can write down these different ways you can learn while having a little bit of fun at the same time. You got that paper and pencil? I'll wait. Good, all right, let's go on. One game I love to play, especially my daughter Maggie, she loves playing this game with me. It's follow the note trail. So you can write down, number one, follow the note trail. And it's so easy to play. All you need is a piece of paper. One piece of paper, fold it up into eighths, and then take your handy little scissors and cut it up into those eight parts. Then what you do is you have a place you start from with the game. We usually start from, say, the kitchen table. That's where the first clue will be. So what you do with your eight little pieces of paper is you write a clue where they can find the next piece of paper. And you hide the eight pieces of paper all around the house. So you might start out on the kitchen table. There's a piece of paper there that says plant on it. OK, well, there might be a few plants in the house, but look around and you'll find the right one. Then on the next one, I wrote my bed. See, this is a game you can do even if you're young and just learning how to write. And then the next one, you go to the bed and it says desk. Ah, OK, so the next clue will be on the desk. And maybe it's not just sitting out in plain view. Maybe it's on the desk, but it's underneath something just barely sticking out. You don't want to make it too hard, but not too easy either. And then when they go to the desk, the next one says closet. Oh, well, that might be a whole world of whoa. But somewhere in that closet is the next one. And it says bathtub. Oh, you could hide one in the bathtub. And so what you see, as you're following the clues, you're going from room to room around the house. This is actually a really fun game. It's exciting. You get to the bathtub, and there's another one that says microwave. Now, I wouldn't suggest putting it in the microwave, because cooked paper is not very tasty. But maybe underneath the microwave, sticking out a little bit. And then you go to the next one, and it says TV. And then you get to the TV, and there it is, the eighth one. And it says, you win. Or you can write whatever little message. Now, that's how you can play this game if you want to kind of keep it simple. But you can also step it up a bit. So let's say you're older. You're in fourth, fifth grade, middle school, high school. And you say, hey, I think I could step this game up a little bit. So instead of just writing where to look, you're going to make it more of a riddle or even more challenging. For example, this first one I wrote, hands sweep the face. Hmm, hands sweep. Where is that one going to be? The clock. You see how it's a little bit of a riddle there. Hands sweep the face. So that next clue will be at the clock. And you go to the clock, and it says, creamy, not crunchy. Oh, you got that one pretty easily. Yeah, that's the peanut butter. There you go in the cabinet, and you open it up. And underneath the peanut butter, there's another clue. And it says, ooh, well, let's say you're learning Spanish. You might write one in Spanish, debajo de mi almohada, under my pillow. And so you run to the bedroom, you look under the pillow, and there's the next clue. Uh-oh. Now this one is taking high school chemistry. So they wrote NaHCO2, which is the chemical formula for sodium bicarbonate, more commonly known, yes, as baking soda. So you run to the kitchen and throw open the pantry doors, and there it is, the baking soda. And the next clue, it says, hope is a thing with, ooh, this is a tricky one. It says, hope is a thing with dot, dot, dot. Wow, well, you'd have to know the poetry of Emily Dickinson to know that famous line, hope is a thing with feathers. Ah, the next clue will be at the bird cage. So you go to the bird cage, and it says, achoo. Where do you think that one is? 
You got it, at the pepper. So you go to salt and pepper and there at the pepper. And it says, if I had this, I'd use it in the morning. If I had this, I'd use it in the morning. You might be thinking, well, what do I do in the morning? I brush my teeth, I eat breakfast. I... Oh, but then you say, ah, no, that's a line from a famous folk song. If I had a hammer, I'd hammer in the morning. And so you run to the closet where there are a couple of tools, and there you find the hammer and the note that says, you win, or whatever message you want to put. So that is number one, if you're taking notes, follow the note trail. See, you get to write, you get to think up interesting riddles, so you can do a little bit of learning and run around the house like a crazy person at the same time. The next game you need no materials for. This is a fun one. It is called Questions, and this is one that Maggie and I love to play in the car. So you're driving somewhere, maybe it's a long drive, you're going out to the beach, and we can play a game of questions. And here's how you can start a game of questions. You say, do you want to play questions? Now, what kind of statement is that? It, oh, it's got the question mark. OK, so, so you have to ask questions. So now, what makes this so difficult is that you want to answer the question. But you can't. You have to answer the question with a question. So if she says, Dad, do you want to play questions? I'll say, hmm, is this a good time for it? And she might want to say, yes. Oh, but you can't, because that's answering the question. That's a statement. Oh, OK, so it has to be an interrogatory. OK, so, uh, so I said, is this a good time for it? She might say, well, what else do we have to do? Ah, OK, and then I'll come back. Now, I might want to change the subject so we're not just talking about the game. I might say, do you see that over there? And Maggie will say, what? Where? Oh, she good. It's two questions, but that counts. It's all questions. And I say, and I want to say, over by the bridge. Oh, but that's a statement. See, it has to be a question. So, so this is tricky at first. And with a little bit of practice, you will get really good at the game questions. And you can do this with more than two people, in fact. So, And another game, similar to that one, is called Mr. Know-It-All. And this is another fun one that's a little challenging at first, but you get the hang of it quickly. And you could play this with two people or even five or 10 people. And what you do is you ask a science question. Now, any of us on our own might not be able to answer that question, but with the combined brain power of Mr. Know-it-all, any question can be answered. So you start off with a question, maybe something simple like, why is the sky blue? Now, we don't want to answer the question actually accurately. We want to be silly and have a little bit of fun, right? So Mr. Know-it-all speaks one word at a time. So if you're playing Mr. Know-it-all with a line of people, the first one answering the question, why is the sky blue, will just say one word. And each person down the line will add one word to compose an answer, which is ultimately silly. So why is the sky blue? Clouds appear whenever soda opens on the counter, period. So you see, each person contributes one word to it. And this is an exercise in parts of speech and composing complete sentences. Because if he said, clouds umbrella, well, that doesn't work, right? You can't pile up nouns like that. Or if you started with an adjective, like angry, you then have to go to another adjective or a noun. Angry clouds, angry blue clouds. And then when does the sentence end? When you get to that point where someone says, period. OK, so let's try another one. Give me a science question, any kind of science question. Uh, Oh, that's a good one. OK, uh, why are leaves green? Similar to why is the sky blue. OK, why are leaves green? All right. And you might start off with a sciencey word. Chlorophyll runs down streets whenever people start to cry, period. Beautiful. It, 
doesn't have to make sense. In fact, the less sense it makes, the better. So that's how you play Mr. Note All. So we have three things already you can do. Follow the note trail was the first one. You can play questions, that's the second one. The third one was Mr. Know It All. Hope you're taking notes. And here's the fourth one. And yet again, yes, this is another one that Maggie and I love to play in the car, around the house, wherever. It's called I Love You More Than. And it's all about metaphors. So you can play this game by looking around and coming up with a silly metaphor. So I look around and I see a chair. I love you more than chairs love to be sat in. And then the other one of us will say, oh, yeah, well, I love you more than walls love to stay standing. Oh, yeah, well, I love you more than bricks love to be red. I love you more than the dog loves to bark. I love you more than the dog loves to beg for treats. And you go back and forth. I love you more than and see how many things you can come up with. And it helps to look around the room and see what you see and see, oh, how can I build that into it? I love you more than computers love to compute. I love you more than paper loves to be thin and flat. I love you more than paper loves to be eight and a half by 11 inches. And you can just keep going and going with that one. Number five, okay, so review again. Number one was follow the note trail. Number two was the game of questions, where everything's a question. Number three was Mr. Know-it-all, where each person contributes a word to form a sentence. Number four was I love you more than. And now we get to number five, which I call field notes. For this one, you do need a little bit of materials again, maybe two pieces of paper, which you just simply fold in half. And as you know, that will make a nice little eight-page booklet. Now, one way I have my little a little bit of my sewing gear here, so when a button pops off, I can sew it back on. One way to uh, stitch together your little booklet is to stitch it together. And so that's what I did with one I made to show you. So it's called Field Notes, and I drew a red-tailed hawk on there. And you know why I drew a red-tailed hawk? Because I saw one. It was on the top of somebody's basketball hoop, on the backboard, a red-tailed hawk. And so, I don't know, it came out all right. And what you can do with field notes, say, let's say uh, you're spending a little more time around the house than usual these days, well, you might look out the window and just look and see what you see. And so I wrote about, not only did I see a red-tailed hawk, I saw two pileated woodpeckers. Those are the ones with the big red crest on top. And they're, they're rather large, and the white and black backs. And the two of them were together, and they were calling back and forth. And so I wrote about it. And maybe you'll see some little birds, and you won't know what their names are. That's fine. You describe them. So each day, you can add to your field notes, looking out the window, what do I see? And there are many ways you can do that, not just birds. You can also th um, think about what's the weather like today. Maybe you could record the weather each day, and not necessarily in terms of the temperature, but how sunny is it? How cloudy is it? Is the moon visible? You could keep a moon phase record as a part of it as well. Another way to do field notes, or you could add it to it, is if you have a camera or a phone you can use, you can take a picture out the window at the same time or around the same time each day, and then by the time You've been going at it for a while. You'll be able to scroll through and see, wow, what are the little changes in the world outside my window each day? All right, so now you have five things you can do. I'll run through them for you again, make you check your notes. You have follow the note trail, questions. Number three was Mr. Know-it-all. Number four was I love you more than. And number five was field notes. And now we have one more little thing we can do about determining the theme of a story, really. Well, I think this is the perfect story. So let's go sit down and read a story together. <clears throat> this story is called Pandora's Box. And you may be familiar with it. So there's a woman, her name is Pandora, and obviously she has a box. Have you ever had a 
box. Oh, maybe you found some Christmas presents or they were put out underneath the tree. Oh, and you're just bursting with curiosity to know what's in it. Maybe you snuck it over and gave it a little shake trying to find out. Well, that's very similar to what happens in this story. And I think this is the perfect story for us to hear right now. Pandora's Box. Long ago, there lived on Earth a man named Epimetheus. He lived alone in the country near the sea. One day, Epimetheus heard a knock on his door. He opened it and saw a lovely maiden standing before him. Epimetheus had never seen anyone like her before. She had flowers in her hair. She wore a long robe of fine cloth. She held a small harp and a golden box. There it is. My name is Pandora, she said. May I come in? The god Zeus sent me to be your wife. Oh, the god Zeus. Oh, does this sound familiar? Yes, Greek mythology. Epimetheus had once been warned by his brother, Prometheus, never to accept any gifts from Zeus. But Epimetheus could not turn Pandora away. She was the first woman on earth. Yes, you may come in, he said. Pandora brought her harp and golden box into the house. What is in the golden box? Epimetheus asked her. I do not know, she said. Zeus gave it to me, but he told me never to open it. Well then, I suppose you should not, said Epimetheus. Yes, I suppose not, said Pandora. And so Pandora and Epimetheus began a happy life together. There were no troubles on earth at that time. Pandora spent her days baking and weaving and playing her harp. That sounds like a good way to spend the day, doesn't it? No troubles, baking, weaving, playing your harp. She liked to run in the fields and swim in the ocean. She was curious about everything on earth, the plants and animals, the birds and trees. And she was also very curious about the golden box. Often she took it out from underneath her bed and held it up to the light and turned it around. Are you looking at that box again? Epimetheus asked her one day. Yes, said Pandora. Do you think I could take a little peek inside? No, Zeus told you not to, said Epimetheus. Pandora sighed. Ah, I suppose you are right, she said. I will put it out of sight, someplace I never go. So Pandora hid the golden box in the wine cellar, but every day she went to the wine cellar to look at the golden box. Are you looking at that box again? Epimetheus asked one day. Yes, sighed Pandora. I'm so curious to know what is in it. Maybe it is full of silver and gold. But Zeus told you never to open it, remember? Epimetheus said. Perhaps you should take it out of the house and put it someplace far away. I suppose I should, said Pandora. So Pandora carried the golden box down to the sea and she buried it deep in a cave near the water. That should do it, she said. But late that night, Pandora woke up. She thought she heard voices telling her to hurry to the sea cave and open the golden box. She thought she could feel invisible hands pulling her from her bed. Think she should go do it? Should she go open the box? She was told not to. Pandora got up and crept out of the house. She carried a lantern down to the cave near the sea, and she dug up the golden box. Uh-oh. She was just about to open it when Epimetheus yelled, Stop! I heard you get up, and I followed you, he said. I think you need to put the box in a new hiding place. And so, in the rosy dawn, Pandora carried the golden box back home. 
She put the box inside a large storage jar. Then she put the storage jar inside an old chest. She tied a rope around the chest and then put the chest down, down deep into an empty well in the garden. Dear me, she said, surely that will do it now. From then on, Pandora tried very hard to forget about the box. She planted her garden and played her harp. She took care of the animals and swam in the sea. But, ooh, that word tells us something's about to take a turn. But one rainy spring day, when her husband was away from home, Pandora found herself feeling very curious about the golden box. I wonder if it is still there, she said. It was raining hard as Pandora went outside. Lightning flashed and thunder cracked in the sky. Pandora pulled on the rope that hung outside the empty well. Up came the chest. Pandora pushed the chest along the wet grass to a covered courtyard. She took the storage jar out of the old chest. Then she took the golden box out of the storage jar. The rain came down harder than ever. As Pandora held the golden box in her hands, it gleamed in the misty stormlight. She thought she heard the box say, open me. Should she do it? You think she's going to? No, I must not, she yelled. She started to put the golden box back into the storage jar. But then she stopped. Maybe. I will just take a quick peek, she said, and then I will not be curious about it anymore. Pandora held her breath as she gently lifted the lid of the box. Out flew a creature, a horrible, ugly thing with wings. Pandora cried out and dropped the box. More ugly creatures flew out, squealing and screeching and flapping their wings. They flew around Pandora's head, calling out their names. Envy, greed, meanness, rudeness, hate, spite. Pandora covered her head with her hands. The creatures flapped their wings some more. Then they flew out of the courtyard and into the world. Oh, what have I done? Pandora said. She began to cry. Wait, look, look at me. A tiny voice came from inside the box. Oh, please, please leave me alone, said Pandora. Look at me, the voice said again. Slowly, Pandora picked up the box. She lifted the lid. There was one creature left inside. This creature was not ugly. It had a beautiful face, and a golden light shone about it. Stop crying, squeaked the little creature. I will help you and others if you take care of me, and do not let the other creatures kill me. Pandora stopped crying and gently lifted the shining creature out of the box. What is your name, she asked. The creature answered, I am Hope. Pandora hugged hope to her heart. From then on, life on Earth was different. People were no longer always happy and carefree. They now had bad feelings as well, feelings brought by the ugly winged creatures. But there was always hope, and hope helped protect people from the evils that had flown out of Pandora's box. The end. Now, when we think about the theme of a story, I like to say it's the meaning, the message, the moral. Why did the writer write this story? There are many themes inside most stories, not just one. We could talk about curiosity and, and how Epimetheus tries to help her and, and how she tells herself little stories, little lies about what she's really doing. Many themes inside this story, but obviously, what's the number one? theme of the story of Pandora's box. That's right. All the evil things in the world, all of that, we still have what? We still have hope. And with that lesson, 
I hope we all learned something today.